Previously on Inner's Engine Radio. Yeah, there's a quote from the Tao that I really like, which is um, Tao 11. 30 spokes meet at the wheel's axis. The center space makes the wheel useful. Form clay into a cup. The center space gives it purpose. Frame doors and windows for a house. The openings make the house useful. Therefore, purpose comes from what is there because of what is not there. That's that open space. We all need that. Welcome to Intersension Radio. Welcome to Intersention Radio. I'm your host, Chris McCleary. And for those of you who are new to the show, we are in search of a sustained sense of inner peace that remains with us no matter what's happening around us. And in order to do this, we need to look at all sorts of different facets of our life, including the science, the psychology, the emotional work, the nutrition, the movement and exercise, all sorts of different spheres that we need to uncover and resolve in order for us to get a sustained sense of inner peace. Today's guest is is one of those premier professionals in the world of psychology, Dr. Stephen Hayes. He's a psychologist who actually developed, well, many different things, but acceptance and commitment therapy, also known as acceptance and commitment training in some circles. It's a model that is six parts that has been shown to be very effective in reducing all sorts of mental health issues and increasing satisfaction levels and richness in in life. And it proposes to bring about psychological flexibility is the key goal, the key concept under ACT therapy. What's really cool about this show is that intersension therapy is founded upon ACT principles, which were designed by Dr. Stephen Hayes. So now we have the originator of ACT therapy coming on the show to talk to listeners about what they can expect from an ACT therapist, from an intersention therapist. So let's get into the show, but realize this information is very deep. There's a lot of topics that we're going to cover. Kind of let the information sink in. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to write me at innersention at gmail.com. And we have the various books that Dr. Stephen Hayes has written on the website. So if you go to innersention.com and you hit the radio button, go find Dr. Stephen Hayes's interview and you can peruse some of those books. Let's get into the interview. I have the hailed Dr. Stephen Hayes from Nevada. You're in Reno, sir, aren't you? I am indeed. He is a clinical psychologist with uh, an emphasis in contextual behavior, Nevada Foundation professor at Department of Psychology at the University of Nevada, Reno. He's a prolific author. I lost count at 40 books and 550 articles. That's the latest info I could find. Well, it's 19- about 625 and about 45 books now. There sir. you go. Yeah, I was wondering if you <laughs> had gotten up, up to 50 yet. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that as well, the uh, the books and maybe even the articles. But in 1992, this is quoted by the Institute of Scientific Information, the 30th highest impact psychologist in the world. Wow. And uh, And really, this is just the beginning. On Wikipedia says that Hayes' work is somewhat controversial, and although that probably doesn't sound like a good thing, that makes him a hero in my book, and he's um, well known in psychology really to be a a paradigm shifter, and not just one, but uh, several times, one with the relational frame theory, and then the other one that I know of that I really ultimately wanted to bring him on the show for is acceptance and commitment therapy. He's the co-founder of this therapy. And I've got to say, I pretty much use this model every day in my daily life. And it freaking works. Welcome to the show, Dr. Hayes. Well, that's really, uh, that's really great to be here. And uh, I use it every day in my life too. 
So this is kind of how the world sees Stephen Hayes. And uh, I almost was going to introduce you as the, we don't need an introduction for this, for this man, but Dr. Hayes, who is Stephen Hayes from Stephen Hayes point of view? Oh, just some guy. Actually, I, you know, what I'm trying to do is to, to bring a particular kind of science tradition to these deepest uh, human questions of just uh, who are we? Why is it so hard to be human? Why is it so hard to find peace of mind and so forth? And to do it in a way that's not uh, arrogant, you know, that is not like, well, we've got the answer, but in a way that, uh, uh, you know, offers the possibility of a new take on things that the wisdom traditions and art and literature and the deeper clinical traditions have grappled with. But not only is this in a way that took the best advantage of Western science. So I'm kind of a, uh, it goes back to, you know, the commitment I made even in high school that I was going to find a way to bring together these worlds of um, the humanities and literature and things I really cared about and spirituality, things like that question, and Western science. And so uh, uh, it isn't just me. I, I uh, uh, kind of jumped in and uh, uh, said, uh, oh, no, it's 600 uh, articles and stuff. I, you know, most of those things are with other people. When I hear those numbers, I usually think, get a life, you know. But but the reason why it's possible is that there's a large community of people that uh, – really have taken seriously that possibility that there's something new that could happen by taking these deep human questions and approaching them from a kind of bottom-up, process-oriented, careful behavioral science. Is there a lot left to do? I mean, you've made quite a few changes, quite a big impact. I mean, obviously, I made, you know, stated that quote earlier, but what's left for Steve? Oh, man. You know, I'm really excited about where things are, because what I've found is as we go deeper and we bring people in, new things keep opening up. And so the last few years, I've been working really hard trying to link behavioral science to evolutionary science, because I think, you know, that's really the queen of the theories of the life sciences. And it's been disconnected from the kinds of uh, things that uh, we deal with in clinical psychology and self-help and all the rest. And the other part is that uh, I'm working with my colleagues to really change the model of what evidence-based interventions are from this era that we went through of one named protocol after another, one particular method after another, linked to all these syndromes and sub-syndromes that supposedly people have, as if someday we're going to find there's some hidden disease inside you that underlies anxiety, depression, PTSD, and you name it. And instead, going towards a, a model that really says, no, most of these are normal psychological processes gone awry. And if you understand the process, processes, the actual steps, the sequences that people go through, well-meaning, but uh, sometimes misdirected, that lead to human lives uh, narrowing, and you find a way to turn them, uh, you can uh, not fix people, they're not broke, broken, not repair people, or but liberate people and uh, give people the tools that they need to direct their own lives in a positive direction. So uh, we call that process-based therapy, ACT is, a, I think, a very good model of it, but there's others out there. So I'm off out onto new adventures, but not in ways that uh, contradict what I've done before, rather in ways that build on what bef what goes before. And I'm excited about where that could uh, take us over the next uh, decade or so. Well, I am. I'm absolutely excited as well. I uh, I wanted to take the you, you brought up the anxiety example on a, and um, very well said. I'm wondering also if um, anxiety could just be a normal phenomenon of being human and not even a, sometimes not even a dysfunction and some sometimes actually helping us out in ways. You betcha. I mean, if you make a list of emotions and then just ask, uh, what are the conditions under which I really need that one and that one and that one? You'll find that there's a, there are times and situations you need every single one of them. And yet, you know, the the kind of dictator within, the voice within can easily categorize our emotions into ones we like and dislike. And of course, 
you know, we start then bringing this problem solving mode of mind into, well, how do we get rid of the ones we don't like and only have the ones we do like? And whether you're clinging towards the positive or running from the negative, both of those means that you're not fully here in a way that's sort of open and, and flexible. And uh, both of those forms actually turn out to be toxic. They limit our ability to move forward. I I usually give an example of this. I ask people, okay, okay I'm going to give you an emotion word, and you can only say the word good or bad in response. And I'll say happy, everybody says good. I say sad, everybody says bad. Anxiety, they say bad. Joy, they say good. Yeah, and then I tell the story of uh, rushing down on Southwest Airlines to be there to watch my mother die. Uh, you know, getting there just in time. She knew I had arrived. She no longer was speaking and sitting with her as she went through the last few hours of her life. And, uh, you know, finally that breath that was not followed by another one. And I said, how do you think I felt? People say, you probably felt sad. I said, you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I felt. That's a bad thing, isn't it? And people get very nervous. They don't want to say it's a bad thing. But I say, dude, you just told me it was bad just minutes ago. I said sad and you said bad. So that's how stupid we are, uh, that we will turn anxiety into our enemy or or sadness or uh, you know, boredom or you name it. and um, Or we cling to you know, these positive emotions as if our life depended on it, when actually what our life depends upon is being able to be here in the present to bring our whole history with us. And part of that means being able to feel those echoes from the past that show up in the present that we call emotions. Uh, and to think the thoughts we think and to sense the senses we sense and remember the memories we have and all of those things you know, the normal kind of judgmental problem solving mode of mind will turn into a problem to be solved instead of uh, parts of life to be experienced and used in the interests of our yearning for connection and contribution, creativity, recreation, for being able to be in a process of living a whole human life. Mm. I have a uh something that was brought up by your questioning of these different emotions. I've heard this before. I wanted to get your take on it. Is excitement and anxiety the same emotion? Just perceived well, you, differently? you probably know physiologically it's darn hard to detect the two, you know, and we, we talk about not things that we have, you know, I was talking about that earlier, just about the, what's happened with the syndromes entering into our culture. You know, I have this disorder. I have that disorder. We also talk about emotions as if there's something that we have, you know, as if they're things. But actually, if you look just within the written record, I mean, some emotions weren't talked about at all, even 150 years ago. And we kind of created them out of whole cloth as ways of talking about these tendencies that we have. The underlying uh, neurobiology of them is far less clear. You know, Darwin suggested there was a big five, but even those can be challenged. And you get into things like depression or angst or, I mean, you can see it even in the metaphors that are there. Anxiety came from a word that meant you can't breathe. And you have to imagine a time where you couldn't just say I was anxious. You'd have to say, I can't breathe. Uh, uh, other examples I use are, are very simple ones, like wanting something. You, you know, uh, mm -hmm. well, want, want came from a word that just meant missing. So, uh, vaunt, it's still in our English. We say, for want of food, he died, you know, meaning just missing. And it was, it's, it's a, an, oh, I believe, an old Norse word. Um, it may not be Norse. I'm trying to think of vaunt. But uh, you have to imagine the time where to say that you'd want something, you'd have to come in and say, missing missing milk you know like so emotions but my point here is that this is new stuff this is not issues of blood and bone that we evolved to deal with these are highfalutin kind of new things that are only sometimes a few hundred years old or less and we treat them as if there's things that we have to hang and have and cling to or run from and avoid and what they are just are ways of speaking about aspects of our whole experience that are far richer than the words themselves and 
that are kind of penetrated by what our purposes are, what the current context is, what we're trying to get accomplished, what our history is. And so if we're able to sort of sit with the ambiguity of our own feelings, sensations, memories, emotions, it's it's easier for us to uh, to use them in ways that fit the current situation and not be dictated to by, oh, I'm feeling anxious, therefore I have to do this. No, just notice the anxiety, notice what's around you, notice what you're trying to accomplish, and see if that little aspect of the whole that you're calling anxiety isn't something that could usefully come along for the ride, might even help you out a little bit. And that's what you see in the uh, linkage, even to things like excitement. Um, but but I don't like, sometimes people say that by way of saying, oh, you know, you're not really anxious, you're excited, as if we have to change it to that. You know, like these so-called negative emotions, all of them we pay good money for to produce. You know, we go to horror shows, we ride roller coasters, we pay right. good money for, you know, for tearjerker um, films or songs or, you know, so you can't name any emotion that isn't uh, of interest to you enough that you pay to seek it out. And so what are we running from or what are we clinging to? Couldn't we just uh, instead have a, a, a more wise posture, a more open, peaceful even posture that allows what's present in our experience to be part of the whole and not be dictated to by any one part? Uh, rather, uh, you know, carry the whole of our experience forward towards the kind of lives that we want to live. Very well said. And and in there kind of sounded like the feeling comes in and then the mind tries to figure out what that is. I think that's what you said. So the meaning exactly. there could be the suffering or the start of the suffering as we start to resist what we think the meaning is. Is that kind of the concept you're... Well, it's, it's, you know, part of what's in there could be the meaning of it. It could, and part of that meaning may be the history of it. It, it may be uh, something that even goes beyond words. Let me use it, give you an example. If you had to pick the highest correlate with a, a key act concept we call experiential avoidance, which is the tendency to try to create a empowering human life by avoiding uh, a, a particular kind of emotions. The single highest correlate to that in psychology is alexithymia, which is not knowing what you feel at all. Because if you're pretty good at, at running from emotions, eventually you become so stupid, you don't even know what you're feeling. You don't even know what's present. You're not able to read your own memories, sensations, uh, emotions, etc. And so it's a rich soup. It's subtle. It's not any one thing. And so, for example, let's say you're in a situation with uh, somebody that you've newly met, and there's a little subtle feeling of unease that's there. There's something about this guy that um, feels familiar, but maybe a little bit off, a little bit threatening. And may it be this is a guy that's not safe to go home with. Uh, you know, more is going on than what he's saying, and you sense it. Well, if you're alexithymic, if you don't know your own emotions, you can't name them, you can't talk about them, you can't sense them. And let's say part of that with regard to relationships might be that you have a history that's been abusive. You've been abused in the past. You've found yourself in difficult situations. And uh, if you're determined not to remember that, not to sense that, not to carry that, it, it predicts alexithymia, predicts I don't know which in turn predicts the likelihood that you'll be, uh, in fact, abused again. So the, the people who need it the least are most likely to have it. So I'm using that as an example of part of the gift of emotions and of experience is that it carries the past into the present, but not in a simple cartoon way. You can't reduce your whole of your experience to one or two words. You want things that are more intuitive, that are felt senses, that are just kind of a, a you know, a feeling or an aura. Or, or It's how you read situations. And um, uh, that is lost when we get into a normal problem-solving mode of mind in which we're trying to 
you know, play out with the bad and in with the good with their own experiences instead of, you know, all aboard uh, uh, the trains leaving the station where, where all of your experiences are part of your own process of learning how to be in the world and how to be uh, wise about where you put your time and effort. Mm. I love those examples. Um, before it gets too late, I really want to get get on to the uh, ACT therapy because sure. this model, I believe, has some of the biggest impact on helping us achieve a state of inner peace. And I want to kind of go through this in, from the mind of the person who created it. And uh, so acceptance and commitment therapy, Dr. Hayes, just give uh, – for those listeners who have never heard of it before, just a real brief summary so that they're not lost when we kind of talk about it, but they can search on their own more in depth on this this model after you talk about it, and we're going to have questions about it. Well, except to commit to therapy or when it's used in settings that are not therapy because the same basic methods are used in work sites or sports or things like that where it's called acceptance and commitment training. Either way, the acronym is ACT, by the way, not ACT, which always reminded me of ECT, the old shock therapy. So mm. we, call it, we call it ACT. But ACT is combining acceptance and mindfulness processes with commitment and behavior change processes to produce psychological flexibility. And psychological flexibility is this process of coming into the present as a whole human being with your thoughts, feelings, memories, bodily sensations as they are, not as what they say they are, and being able to allocate your attention flexibly, fluidly, and voluntarily towards what brings meaning and purpose in your life and get your behavior organized around that. So it's this process of consciously opening up, coming into the, the present, and then being able to focus on what your values are and what you would have to do in the world of habits and uh, modes of mind, what you would actually have to do with your own behavior to uh, build those values into your uh, life more and more over time. And it turns out that set of processes, there's six that you can discern. I can walk you through what those six are just by names and stuff, but I've already said them. Those six flexibility skills predict more about how things go badly when you don't do them and how things go well when you do them, do them than any other uh, set, arguably, in all of uh, science. It accounts for more outcomes in more areas with more strength, I believe than any other model uh, that we know of in the world of uh, Western science. And it echoes with ancient wisdom traditions and frankly, with things that are wise about all of our culture. It's not like we don't know these things. Most of us know it actually from the inside out. In fact, I can prove it to you in just a minute if you'd uh, allow me an example. Please, please an do. An example of how, okay. I'd ask listeners to think of somebody who lifted them up powerfully, empowered them, a, a person, ideally somebody you know and have met, but it could be a spiritual figure or somebody you've not actually met, but even better, somebody you know directly, a coach, a parent, sibling, friend, therapist, lover, somebody who somehow has that impact on you. And I just have a few questions to ask about the person that you've picked. So pick one, get that person in mind. When you were with them, did you feel profoundly accepted for who you are? Were you constantly being judged or did that seem to be far away? When you were together, was it clear that it was two conscious people who were together? And could you be together in ways that kind of fit the opportunities of the moment? Did the person care about your values or they were only thinking about what they wanted to do and what they cared about? And could you be together in ways that your actual behavior never kind of contradicted those values, but actually took advantage of the situation to do things that were useful and were respectful of what you cared about. Those are the six flexibility questions. And if I'm guessing in the answers you just gave, here's a way to say it. You know how to pick heroes, guides, uh, you know, people who empower you to be people who reflect psychological flexibility. They embody it. They support it in you by example and actually in interactions by encouragement. And so 
you already kind of know that. You don't pick people who are constantly wangering fingers at you or who don't really know who you are or who are looking at their watches as soon as they walk into the door, you know, trying to shorten their interactions with you or it's always one way, my way or the highway. You don't pick people who ride over these six processes that we call acceptance, diffusion, which is our word for non-judgment, flexible, fluid and voluntary attention from this conscious witnessing observer, more spiritual point of view, and linking to values and committed action built around values. Those are the six. And so in area after area, uh, we kind of know it. Uh, we know it by the guides and heroes we pick. Can I give you another example? Of way you Absolutely. Know? Okay, yes, a really quick one, a really quick one. Pick an issue that you struggle with and then Put your body, if nobody's watching, you can actually do it while you're listening. Put your body in the shape, if you were a sculptor, that you would want people, if they walked by and they saw that sculptor of that body, they'd have an idea of what's going on inside that person. Put your body in the shape of you at your worst with that issue. Express with your body, you at your worst. And now express with your body, shift it. Take a little mental photo of that first one, you at your best. The same issue, sometimes you do better than other times. You at your best with that issue. What is your show that with your body? We've asked this of hundreds of people around the world, and regardless of culture, whether you're in Iran or Africa or in Canada or the US, when you're you at your worst, your arms come in, your head goes down, your eyes close, your fists clench, you tighten, you you go into a semi-fetal position, you have some thing that, that says flee, fight, or flop, you know, the some defensive or aggressive posture. Conversely, you at your best, your head comes up, your eyes open, your arms go out, your hands get free. You might even stand and walk. Yeah, that's an expression of being here, present, and able to interact and move, to be aware, connected. That's okay. the same six processes. You can't do attentional flexibility. You can't do openness. You can't do you know, contact with the current context or you can't do moving towards what you care about when you're in a fetal position or when your hands are clenched and you're fighting or when you're running away to do that you got to stand up open your eyes put your arms out and have the capacity to interact in in ways so i take people before they know anything about the what the science shows and ask them questions like that and they always give the right answer They'll show with their body they know the right answer. They'll show with the people they pick that they know the right answer. And then you know, when they're struggling, they show with their behavior that they're going to do the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the human condition. It's because there's one part of us, this part that you and I are engaging in right now, this talking part of us, and allowing it to slip over into judgment and problem solving and then trying to solve you're trying to live your life as a problem to be solved instead of as a process to be experienced. And once you do that, there is no peace of mind. There is no answer. There is no way out. And you're headed downhill in one way or another. This one form of rigidity or another, whether it's a drug addiction or anxiety or depression, or if it's just social withdrawal, loneliness, alienation, disconnection. And so, um, uh, Finding a way to stand with the wisdom within and to stand with the wisdom that the best parts of our culture have given to us is really what uh, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Act is all about, is giving people the, the tools and methods to do that. Thank you for those examples. Um, do you think there is, or maybe you even designed it around it, but is, is there a sense of inner peace inside of ACT? Or was there intended on being some inner peace in there? Is it just my imagination or my I feelings think, and, and points? I, no, it's not your imagination at all. You know, I think the whole world is yearning for peace of mind with purpose. That's that's the current challenge. And it's a big, big challenge in part because of what's happened in our world where we're constantly exposed to horror all around the world. We feel as though things are getting worse and worse. In fact, if you had to pick one time to be born and you didn't know where you'd be born in the world, right now, the present moment would be the best time. There's less disease, less violence, less poverty, less 
and, and everything. And we're better off now than we ever were as human beings on this planet. But man, we're living behind our gated walls and our, you know, locked doors with our cameras. And we're, you know, you know, trying to keep the immigrants out. And we're worried about who's going to, you know, take stuff from us and kids can't ever go outside anymore no you get if you do what you're you know if i do what i happened when i was a kid i'm almost 70 but i am 70, <laughs> almost 70 if i if i you know you'd be arrested for child endangerment my mom would say bye and we'd be gone all day long oh gosh i was so gone all day in the woods gone all day and you know and it's part of our evolutionary history this is how kids learn they work in little bands and troops that do it all kinds of stuff and, you know, even nowadays, even play gets supervised and structured by adults. You know, this is not new. This is not anything that ever existed on the planet. That what's happened is, is that we're exposed to the media to, to horror. And then we're also constantly exposed to judgment. You know, just turn on your news show. I don't care which one you like, whether it's MSNBC or Fox, you're going to get a lot of judgment. And we're constantly be exposed to comparison. And we're always on the shortest end of the stick. If you want to find out what a billionaire's bathroom looks like, you can just pick up your iPhone. And uh, I, you know, I was to tell the story. I was I was looking at a picture of a guy with a didgeridoo wearing a loincloth, and you know, an Aboriginal person in the outback of Australia, you know, sitting there underneath a gum gum tree, you know, tapping into his iPhone. You know, in that world. Uh, you are always going to be found to be on the short end of the stick and social media really promotes that in a toxic way. So we have through science and technology made a busier, more threatening, more cacophonous world. And how are we going to produce peace of mind with purpose inside that world? It turns out, actually, I think the evolutionists are pretty good at knowing how you get peace of mind, you know, peace in groups of organisms. How does that happen? It happens by cooperation. It happens by the group being of importance and by some dampening down on selfishness. And uh, in, in, a, in a way, what we've done, I think, with our very mindy, judgmental, problem-solving oriented culture and with the challenges presented by science and technology is we're feeding a very selfish part of us uh, socially, but even just within our own psychology, where it's kind of like one part of us, this uh, more ego based, story based, I am fill in the blank, which is give me all your evaluations, you know, I am this educated person who makes this much money and is really good because and then you make a list secretly hoping people don't know that there's another list of the things you could make or the, uh -huh. the flaws that you have. And then, and then you start defending that clown suit as if it's you. And what you're doing is you're doing the exact opposite of what produces a piece because you're feeding only one part of you at the cost of other parts of you. Um, can I give you an example from evolution science? Please do. Okay, this is a really cool kind of experiment done with birds that are raised in cages to lay eggs. Cage-raised hens supply most of the eggs that we eat. It's not very humane, but seven birds to a cage. Okay, here's the experiment. Take the hens that lay the most eggs and allow them to reproduce. Second arm of this experiment. Take the cages that produce the most eggs and all the hens in there get to produce. Take it out for six, six generations. Which one wins? Now, you might think that if I just make the hens that lay a lot of eggs win by allowing them to reproduce, boy, I'll have a lot of eggs. No, six generations out, your, your egg laying has gone down by a very large percentage. Why? The birds are fighting from morning till night. And by the way, by the time you get six, seven generations out, there's not six or seven birds in there there's like three or four because they've pecked themselves to death because the reason they were laying so many eggs is they were the selfish hens that knew to, how to chase all the hens away while they ate all the food conversely if you do it all the birds in the cage you know there were some peacemaker hens in there that yeah they didn't lay a lot of eggs but they knew how to to you know keep the hen 
hen house happy. And uh, uh, if you do it that way, more and more eggs get laid each generation. So here's the way to say it. If you foster selfishness within, and that's true with any unit, selfishness within a family, selfishness within a couple, selfishness within you, to only parts of you get fed and not other parts, uh, you're creating a, the exact opposite of peace of mind. You're creating a kind of a continual war as parts of you or parts of, of the couple or family or community or, or clinic or what, business or whatever the unit is are uh, you know, being left behind. In the modern world, if, if it's not all of us, it's not any of us. And the same thing happens within. You don't get to choose which memories of yours you'll be able to carry. There's no delete button in the nervous system that's healthy. You know, as the joke goes, sort of a frontal lobotomy or a bottle in front of me. You know, if you have a memory, you've got a memory for life, very likely. And if it's painful, okay, figure out how to make room for that hen. You know, that, that chicken has a place. And it maybe it's a little homely, but it might be there to uh, be useful to you. I mean, it might be the hand that reminds you not to go home with the person who's unsafe or to have that intuitive sense that this relationship is going to be more successful than that one or this job fits my needs better than that one. So you want all your sensory systems open, all of your memories and emotions and thoughts open and uh, peace of mind doesn't mean uh, only one note it means space for all of us and um, I think the ACT model produces that because the acceptance message allows peace of mind around emotion the diffusion around the many contradictory we ha thoughts we have around anything, the attentional flexibility of be about being able to broaden or narrow or shift or stay to serve in attention to fit the current context, this you know, awareness or observing self part that connects you to the awareness of others as you look at somebody else's eyes and realize that you're in a community of conscious beings called human beings and Values providing a guide to take that wisdom that comes from openness forward. So peace of mind is built into the flexibility model in each place, but never in a way that's subtractive. It's never like I get peace by eliminating that anxiety I don't like. No, dude, that's not peace. That's called war. It's war within and you will fight that war for the rest of your life and never win it. You better find a place for the anxiety to have a seat and to be welcomed and to be part of it, or the sadness, or the history of abuse, or the guilt, or the areas where you've let people down, or whatever. They're part of it too. And it's a different model of peace. It isn't that model that's subtractive. It's the one that's uh, built into, I think, a progressive human vision of the whole of us, all of us together belong. Now, and one, one thing that's kind of out of the scope of this discussion is when boundaries have to come in because, you know, you physically getting abused or, or whatever. And, yeah. You know, that's not inclusion. I, I don't want my clients in being, you know, including that and be more open to that they deserve their boundaries and to be safe, but we're talking more of the in, intra scape, right? The inside of us. Yeah, exactly. And... No, of course. And in fact, I, you know, we got pushback on that just because of the name of acceptance and commitment therapy. When it first became popular, people were saying, Oh, you're, you're asking people to accept abuse or to, to accept uh, domination. And, but the literature shows is the exact opposite. When you, when you open up to your own, experience as a whole human being you are more able to step forward and set healthy limits because in a way it's less of a threat to you you know that part of you that says oh no i'll be all alone if i leave this abusive relationship no you won't you will be connected to yourself and out of that connected to others and yeah it is going to 
means some painful emotions, for example, to abandon the dream that may have happened when you married this person who turned out to be abusive, but being able to step forward if you can't solve it in the relationship by leaving the relationship is part of what you may need to do. And it turns out that acceptance empowers you to do that. The, the very first study ever done on acceptance and commitment therapy in the modern era after we developed it in the early 80s and then finally brought it out of the late 90s when we thought it was ready from the work that we'd done on processes and measures and all that, the rest of that was a study done in a bank center where we were working on acceptance with uh, bank workers who were doing calls on debts and so forth, facing hangups and so forth. It's a really difficult job. People don't like to be called about money that they owe banks. And uh, what it turned out is that when you worked on emotional openness, being centered in consciousness, focused on your values, is the workers started demanding changes of the work environment of their supervisors. And the comparison condition was one where they were taught to do that. Uh, it turned out that didn't make people less stressed. It did get them to challenge the, the, uh, 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 the parts of the work environment that are work working. But if instead you empowered people to be more emotionally open and connected to their values, they did that anyway at a level that's even higher than encouraging them to do it. Because most of what keeps us small, that keeps us from doing things that are really in our interests, are our fears and our shame and our guilt and our uh, the way that we allow emotions and thoughts to limit us. So uh, I'm exactly with you. Uh, we're not talking about mm -hmm. uh, acceptance, meaning uh, resignation or tolerance of what shouldn't be tolerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you get the the values that it's almost like in order to stay in a very obviously abusive situation, you have to a not see the higher values of safety and uh, happiness and self, you know, um, seeking happiness, but you also have to ignore. Uh, well, not accept the 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 voice screaming in your head. This isn't right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The acceptance actually says, "Okay, I accept. This is not right." Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes life asks us to do hard things, and uh, uh, in order to do that, uh, you know, the mind says, "Oh, you'll be able to do that when you suppress everything and eliminate everything that." Uh, so, no, that's actually not how it works. It's it's something that's much more self-compassionate and kinder, that you can be a whole person with a painful history mm -hmm. and with lots of emotions about making changes. Change is never easy. And carry all that forward and, and begin to, uh, you know, move the trajectory of your life towards the direction that you want it to take. If you're doing uh, act pretty well in your life and you're gaining this psychological flexibility, which you're saying is the overall goal of, of act or these, these six different points, then should change be easier? Should change start to see uh, maybe even looking forward to change after a while? Yeah, I think if it's, if, if positive change that really fits what you want, what the person between you and the person in the mirror wants. If that doesn't show up, then I don't really believe that the rest of it is that important because life is what we're living. It's what we're doing. And I do think you can get into a space in which change is no longer threatening. It's still challenging, mm -hmm. but challenge does, is not the same thing as threat. And uh, you gave that kind of indication when you talked about the, how close anxiety and excitement is. I mean, when when you are uh, fully challenged by uh, change, that's called growth. That's opportunity. That's prospering. That's not uh, a problem. It's what it looks like to grow. Would this and, be a good test for ourselves if we're not being able to change then maybe we're not doing act as well as we once thought. No, I think I think that's true. And in fact, there's some data on that, which is that uh, psychological flexibility, when it can lead to greater degrees of ability to uh, show self-control and, and uh, deliberate values-based change, uh, is a different creature than some of those 
same things turned towards uh, simply kind of quote accepting like accepting your fate accepting your lot you know the, the, the you know I, I think the bottom line is the capacity to change in a way that fits what you're up to and that changes over time i mean each era of life includes different things most of the people listening to us if you live long enough are going to face health problems let's say you're going to start losing the ability to do certain things. You just look at what the challenges of aging are. And it's going to require change of you. But the that kind of change might include how to find meaning and pur purpose inside the smaller range of things that you can actually do in the world of behavior. Um, you know, I have a family member who's uh, very, very close now to being bedridden. And I'm watching how she's walking this out. She's doing a pretty interesting job of how she can, you know, connect to people through her uh, uh, technology, but also just through the conversations she's having in the supported care facility she's in and so forth. You know, how can you have, uh, how can you alter uh, how you're, doing things in a way that fit the changing situations of your life and take advantage of the opportunities that you're given. I mean, we, you know, pick as heroes, people like Nelson Mandela who for years on end was locked in a cage and could do very, very little. You wouldn't know what he was doing until he was let out of the cage. And turns out what he was doing was pretty post pro social. He didn't come out and say, you you, uh, you, you SOBs are going to pay. You know, he went out and rooted for the white rugby team. I mean, that, you know, is something we had no right to expect, but it turns out he was doing that kind of work in the cage, you know, that he was working on how to be with himself in a way that would then fit the opportunities that he would have later on in life. The metaphor I use of that, it's kind of like if you had a bowl and it had, hold, had water in it, you don't yet know really what the, that water can do until you put a hole in the bowl and then you find that in the context, uh, you know, it, it'll gravity will pour that water right on out. In the same way, if you have a capacity for, let's say, love and connection, creativity, contribution, that doesn't mean that you're yet in a context where you're able to show that. You know, maybe you're you're not in a relationship where your relationship skills are yet able to be shown. For example, it's like water in a bowl. Yeah, but if you're doing that work within yourself, when that opportunity comes, you know, then you'll see it. And you'll see it in the real results as just like you'd see water uh, coming out of the bowl. You'll see the good that comes out of people when they get a chance to... Uh, to contribute that good to the, themselves and others. And because you're present, you'll be able to see that good coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Be able to notice it in yourself and others. And that, yeah. uh, I wanted to uh, encourage people to seek out this act on their own because we're not, this isn't an instruction manual on act. I'm going to be asking more questions about it, but I encourage you to go look up Stephen Hayes. He's all over the internet with videos, um, podcasts, TED Talks, even books. Um, Steve, what's the best book that you think the average layperson would need from you to learn a little bit of how to do ACT on their own? Well, if you don't mind, do you mind me mentioning my website? The website's great, too. Okay, well, I'll mention the book, but just if you go to Stephen C. Hayes, Stephen with a V, Melissa C. for my dad, Charlie, Stephen C. Hayes, H A Y E S dot com, uh, you know, if you log in there, I'll send you a little seven part mini course on ACT, and then I'll send you a newsletter once a month. I don't spam people, it doesn't happen, just a conversation. The popular book, the trade book that is uh, I've written that's best known is Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. Uh, there's other ones that are out there. Uh, ACT has become kind of a little cottage industry. There's probably 150 books in English. There's a book that's Please. coming out. There's a book that's coming out in August uh, from Penguin Avery uh, called A Liberated Mind. 
and it's already up on Amazon. It, and it is, uh, I worked 11 years on that book. Uh, and it was, it's the follow up essentially, or the kind of the think book and the uh, self help book and kind of autobiography that comes out of a liberated mind. So those are two. But you'll find there's, if you have specific areas, you know, like I, I really struggle with diabetes or anxiety or depression or, you know, chronic pain or whatever it is, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, books available on, on that. Just put the acceptance and commitment therapy into uh, a search engine or Amazon or wherever, and you'll find it. Awesome. Um, what do you think inside the ACT model, these six different faces or, or uh, points of action are uh, closely or mostly associated with inner peace offering inner, or is it all of it together? Well, it is all of it, but you know, if I had to pick uh, the ones that are most important first would be finding that sense of self that goes beyond the categorical evaluative judgmental sense of self, but the kind of witnessing, observing, I hear nowness of awareness, pure awareness uh, which is there inside our contemplative traditions or meditative traditions. And there's ways to that uh, ACT has that helps you sort of connect with that sense of self. Uh, it's the most difficult of the six to talk about because it, it doesn't have this quality of a thing with features. It's more just like here or <laughs> now. Uh, self as context or... Being, yeah, we call it self as context. It has about 15 different words. It's that which shall not be named, but not because it's Voldemort, but just because it's not thing like. And it, right, we're talking about the the uh, dimensionless quality of being that's linked to human consciousness. And but once from there, peace of mind, I think, is served by emotional and cognitive openness. Of, of deliberately creating a space in which all your thoughts, feelings, memories, bodily sensations have a place. Uh, now, it doesn't mean they're all equally deserving of attention in a particular moment, but they all have a place. And so then adding to it the attentional flexibility to focus on what is going on inside and out that's of most importance, uh, you know, allows you to not be overwhelmed by the variety of experiences that will happen once you stop uh, running away and trying to subtract and eliminate and line everything up in a nice tidy row once you give up on this model of peace meaning um, uh, uh, orderliness and instead of peace meaning something more like a tabletop that can hold what's put on it uh, from there, you will naturally then start giving yourself the new problems called values. I mean, once you show up, the next thing is what's next, uh, because that's just the kind of monkey we are. Yeah. And that's cool. That's cool. Because if the what's next isn't eliminative, you know, when I'm fixed, then I'll be able to live. But instead is more creative. Now that I'm here, what do I want to do? Um, so peace leads pretty quickly to purpose, which is why I said earlier, peace of mind and purpose is really the sandwich. I love that. What, what happens to an individual who gets really good at this showing up and awareness I'm here and then just does that the rest of their lives. And are they going to start feeling this angst that comes along with the, Hey, knock, knock, knock. You've got a purpose here. Well, sometimes I, I do see that, you know, and I see it. In, in a way that uh, worries me a little bit. And we see it sometimes, I think, in the distortion of the contemplative traditions, for example, that's gone into Western society. You know, in Eastern or in other spiritual traditions where, because they all included mystical and, and contemplative traditions, every single one of them, it isn't just Eastern, but uh, they always had as part of it, right action or, uh, you know, eudaimonia or, uh, you know, what are your values or virtues? Or there was some part of the conversation that said, this is for a larger human purpose. And by the way, not just about you, but about others. Because as you begin to open up, you cannot do that without beginning to notice that there's other conscious beings around you called human beings who are also suffering, who also have pains, who also have challenges. And there's no way to close yourself off to them while opening up to yourself. 
but you can't do it because I mean, all the way down to mirror neurons, we are the kind of monkey we are when we see people of suffering around us, we hurt. And so if you're going to open up, it means opening yourself up also to what is around you in these other creatures around you. And, uh, you know, at that point, caring about the suffering of others and caring about how to put love in the world and how to put compassion into the world and kindness into the world is just kind of a natural extension of this kind, loving, self-compassionate step of being a whole person and creating a space. But I see, in, in, as some of these things are coming into the West, you know, you, you'll find people at the gym or something saying, uh, you know, uh, you take care of the kids. I got to go meditate. You know, you're going like, what? You know, it can just become another form of selfishness. You end up with like meditation junkies or something. You know, I'm a child right. of the 60s. I saw that movie before. And I I just don't think it's where we want to end up. It's not where it does end up inside the indigenous wisdom traditions from which these methods originally came. And we dare not put it into Western thinking when we bring behavioral science and psychotherapy in. Uh, in the same way, you know, if we're going to do it without selfish, it means let's show up as whole human beings, pull the plug on this war within, and yes, seek out peace of mind. But out of that will come the natural creative yearning to uh, to help others and to to show kindness and compassion and love and support. Never mind uh, play, recreation, connection, communication, creativity with others. And that there you're on a values based journey where the entire uh, society is seeking out how we as a species can be better uh, at being human. Mm -hmm. And not just even the ones who are alive, but the ones who are coming, you know, that. You be, begin to care about, are we going to leave a planet that's livable for our grandchildren? Are we going to have an economy that will you know, be there for people who are poor or live in parts of the world where they don't uh, have the advantages that we have in terms of education or resources or the economy and so on? So uh, when I've watched what's happened with flexibility, a flexibility vision, psychological flexibility vision, a peace of mind, it leads to a kind of sense of global consciousness that extends across time, place, and person, even beyond the present to, you know, generations as yet, as yet unborn and how we're going to create a world that's supportive of, um, of human beings now and in the future. Beautifully said. I, I'm doing a little bit of work with uh, collective dreams and showing how we all kind of have the same style of dream or the same memes yeah. you know, throughout the same kind of period of time. So that's kind of cool. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. You, you've, you've been talking about connection quite a bit, but uh, towards the end of all my interviews, I like to see from our experts, what is the biggest block to inner peace and how do we dismantle it? Um, I'd like your top one, but you know, you can have a few, one or two or three. Um, you know, my, my ideas were like acceptance. You mentioned purpose. You also mentioned connection about four or five times. So I, this will be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I had to pick, I'll pick two. Uh, but, you know, one is, uh, as my wife will tell you, you know, I came by experiential avoidance as a um, topic, uh, quite honestly, since I'm uh, 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 a struggle with it. And so, you know, I, I'm, I have some kindness for it. I've done, I've talked a little bit about that in terms of the domestic violence I saw to my home as a young child and kind of what it did uh, to me uh, psychologically. But uh, so uh, one challenge for me is just being able to sit with the vulnerability that comes from being close because it's scary that you're going to be abandoned, you're going to be left, you're going to be found to be... Uh, 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 inadequate in, in some way. And then the other one, which is uh, very seductive and, and uh, interesting to watch, is how the ego part of us, the storied self, the I'm, fill in the blank and tell the story, which always contains issues of comparison. 
And whether it's uh, I'm the lowest of the lowest or I'm the grandest of the grand, it's equally toxic. And so, uh, you know, I have, um, I'm quite aware of the pull of that. And I've tried to kind of lead from behind in the work on the act and make sure that the community steps forward and other people are as known, well known or better known than I am. I'm getting old enough now that if I'm going to step forward, I just have to do it. So I'm doing some things that are more public and out there. And I can feel uh, the challenge that that contains, which is you begin to read your own reviews. You know, you begin to think that uh, you have to be this way or that in order to impress a podcast host or people who listen to it or you know, so there's a clown suit just like a millisecond away that is saying, you know, please climb into me. And uh, I can feel it. And um, and I'm not even necessarily uh, going to completely avoid putting it on. I catch myself putting it on, taking it off, putting it on, take it off, putting it on, take it off. And um, maybe that's just part of the process, but it is one that I think is uh, worthy of note of just having a third eye kind of on how even the things that you learn that are really powerful and useful to you and to others can be turned in a way by this more um, judgmental and self-aggrandizing mode of mind to produce barriers between yourself and yourself and barriers between yourself and others. So that whatever is causing you to um, disconnect from self and others should be the same thing. Is that what you, I'm reading into what you said. Well, I think the barrier is the same thing. It's, it's these fused evaluations, mm. whether it's self description or, or, um, Oh, I can't yeah. have that. I can't feel that. And I think the solution is to keep taking the clown suit off to notice those processes, to show up as a conscious human being and and to try to give witness and voice to this process of being here as a whole person and connecting with others and try to do that in a way that's not about you, but about uh, uh, the good of others. Well, where is the clown suit in the ACT model? Like where would it be if we were the to... conceptualize self. We call it the conceptualized self. It's... Uh, uh, you know, ego is not a bad word, but it's not the way that the act folks talk about it. And it's basically the story that we tell that integrates our experiences. We all need to have a story. We can't avoid having it. But that also includes this kind of evaluation, prediction, expectation, et cetera, uh, that if you're, uh, if you're not wise about it, begins to become this ossified structure in which you're more interested in being right about your story than you are about being able to respond in ways that foster what you deeply care about. Um, and whatever that might be, that could be, oh, I'm a really enlightened person. Uh, well, if you buy into that, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what enlightened is not is that and it's constant you know so act, act can't get you enlightened in huh now it can help <laughs> you see maybe the doors to walk through but more but not as the end in itself maybe uh, just as a bump in the right direction and then uh, uh, but as soon as you start to talk about it and evaluate things in that way I'm very suspicious of uh, mm. the essence of it how about just <laughs> shut up and live? Uh, show me with your behavior and right. show me with your trajectory. Now, show me with your behavior can sometimes mean, oh, yeah, you've got to be practically perfect in every way. You're like the Mary Poppins of uh, mental health. And no, as I say to people, I know I'm, I'm pretty flawed, but you don't know. You used to you should have seen me before, you know, <laughs> uh, the trajectory is what matters. None of us is going to get a blue ribbon at the end. We're not going to get prizes. But if we're growing and if we're pushing the edges out as best we can in the interests of this connection with this deeper sense of 
uh, humanity and, and caring, then I think that's probably what we can hope for ourselves. That's great. It's a great place to start winding down. I really appreciate your time, Dr. Hayes. Thanks for coming on here and uh, enlightening us <laughs> on the ACT model and how to use it for inner peace. It was great talking to you, Chris, and I hope I've been of some service to your listeners. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, people are absolutely going to love it. Um, our therapy intervention, the therapy side of it is built on ACT therapy. And why? Well, I've got a, I've got a long story about how I came to ACT. But, uh, well, bottom line is I, I was on the, the mountain transforming. I've spoken about this in previous podcasts, but I developed a model for myself. It was a two-part model. And basically, it's inspiration and uh, achievement. So it was inspirational achievement. So it was the exact same thing as acceptance and commitment. If you were to put ACT in a two-point model, it would look like mine. And so I, you know, I, I don't know, I immediately gravitated to it. And it was, you know, it's the theory of choice. Now I can talk about the concepts that I know are true to me in a clinical term and uh it can even talk to insurance folks and, uh, <laughs> about <laughs> my concepts cool. but in a but they were formulated 20 years prior to mine and have been studied and and show efficacy great efficacy on uh depression addiction uh gosh everything everything right yeah but, but at this point we have about 280 randomized trials and almost everything you can name. But, you know, part of the, I know we're winding down, but part of the thing that that story tells, Chris, is that, you know, at, at its best, this kind of Western science journey is simply bringing light and giving proper attention, due weight to things that human beings have known right along anyway. There really isn't anything new under the sun, but there is something that can be done that's helpful when you put these human processes through the filter of Western science, you can sort of find a way to talk about it that empowers, doesn't take over, doesn't say this is the only way to talk about it, but sort of gives light and lifts up the things that are really of importance. Mm -hmm. And in the wisdom traditions, for example, or in the deeper clinical traditions, or, you know, almost everybody who's had a transformational experience of the sort that sounds like you had, Chris, my, me too. And I've, told that story in my uh, TEDx, uh, TEDx mm -hmm. talk, you know, there's certain features that show up. And I think it's just because of the way that we are. And science is about finding out the way that we are, but we find out the way we are by experience too. And so you really don't want a science of transformation that, that doesn't connect with what human beings know directly about transformation. And so uh, I'm actually kind of buoyed up by the commonality and connection that's there, you know, with a, uh, your story or an Eckhart Tolle or, you know, any of the, the kind of spiritual leaders who tell these personal stories. And by distilling it through the Western science filter, maybe we can bring something new to it. But it's not new like, oh, that's the first time that's ever been talked about. No, it's new like by by being able to measure and focus on these things, we're able now to sort of simplify. And science at its best, you know, the e equals MC squared type science simplifies. It doesn't make it more complicated. It makes it simpler. It can be, you know, hard to understand in a technological way. That's why you go to school for it. But it shouldn't be hard to connect with when it's about human behavior uh, because that's something we all know something about. So... Um, the metaphor I use, I, I'll, I'll just take a 60 seconds. It's yeah, like if you, please came do. In, if you came into an open field uh, and you, you'd follow this path and you walk and you camp and you figure out where you're going to And suddenly it's an open field and there's sun there and you look and there's like a couple hundred people there. And there's like, there's monks there and there's some priests there, there's scientists there, there's, there's people writing novels there. You, you say, Wow. Hey, how did you get here? Here's the path I showed. And they said, no, no, I didn't follow that path. I followed this path. How did you get here? I followed this path. Hey, oh, I followed this. So, well, if you came into a clearing in the woods with a whole lot of pathways leading to it, 
uh, maybe there's something important about that place. And maybe we shouldn't care quite so much over my path is the only path. Mm -hmm. But instead, maybe we can connect with what's there and to help people find the path that will allow them to find that clearing that is of, of value. And uh, so I'm kind of pleased to see the fellow travelers that are there in unexpected places uh, who talk about things in different ways, but end up uh, connecting in deep ways with the things that we're finding out inside the particular Western science journey. I and the community of working on uh, acceptance and commitment therapy and relational frame theory and all that have been following. Dr. Hayes, I'm just profoundly um, just honored to have you on the show here. Thank you so much for coming on to Intersension Radio. And if I can somehow convince you to come back on, I'll do it. Even pay you to, <laughs> to help me out again. This was great. I'll look forward to it. Maybe on the other side of a liberated mind, we can have a conversation. And uh, love to. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Until next time. Intervention Radio.